It's been said that one reason the Allies won World War II in Europe was that they had penicillin and the Germans didn't. Well, in the autumn of 1942, the Allies start testing penicillin on large scale. But is this really the drug that will win the war? I'm Spartak Souls. Welcome to a World War II in Real Time special, this time looking at the development of penicillin. The discovery of penicillin occurs almost by chance in September 1928. Alexander Fleming, a professor of bacteriology, returns from a two-week holiday to his workplace at St. Mary's Hospital in London. Known for his somewhat careless nature, he has left a petri dish containing a bacterial culture of Staphylococcus on his lab bench, rather than in his rightful place in the incubator. During his absence, the culture has become contaminated and a mold is growing on the surface. Fleming notices that the bacteria around the mold have been weakened and killed. After further examinations, he determines that the mold, a strain of penicillium, secretes a liquid toxic to several strains of bacteria. He publishes his findings in June 1929 and successfully treats one of his lab staff for an eye infection in 1932. However, the time and effort needed to extract and purify usable amounts of the liquid limit its utility. In 1935, Harold Reitstrick, a leading expert on bacteria and fungi, claims the production of penicillin for therapeutic purposes is almost impossible. And why should it be a priority to develop a new antibiotic when they already exist? These are known uh, collectively as the sulfa drugs, based on the compounds of sulfanamide and sulfanilamide. One of these drugs, Prontosil, achieves high-profile success in 1936 when it is used to treat a serious throat infection in FDR's son, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr. And sulfa are a standard issue in most modern militaries. Wounded Germans are given sulfapyridine by mouth and sulfanilamide powder at the location of a wound. And the British War Office recommends that all wounds likely to become infected should be treated with sulfanamides for 48 hours. During the war, sulfa drugs will save huge numbers of servicemen and women and civilians on all sides. But they have some downsides. There's a chance of allergic reaction, they damage white blood cells over long-term use, can cause blockage in the urinary tract, and oral administration frequently causes vomiting. In addition, because of such widespread use, bacteria are starting to become resistant. An allied study carried out later in the war will estimate that 60% of cases of the sexually transmitted infection gonorrhea are resistant to sulfa. Moreover, resistance to one sulfa drug gives resistance to them all. So there is good reason to find new alternatives. In 1939, a team at the University of Oxford are given a grant of $25,000 from the Rockefeller Foundation in America to study the antibacterial action of molds. The team is led by Australian Howard Florey, who sees potential in Fleming's earlier work, and penicillium is a good starting point. He recruits the British scientist Norman Heatley and the German-Jewish Ernst Kain, a refugee from the Nazis who had arrived in 1933. The Oxford team managed to perfect the purification and extraction of penicillin. The mold is grown in fermenting beakers, feeding on a liquid broth. It is into this broth which it releases its vital bacteria-killing liquid. After a long process involving acids, crystallization, and granulation, Flory and his team refine the broth into powdered penicillin, which can be injected into a subject. Not Yet pure enough for use in humans, the first tests are conducted on mice on the night of May 25, 1940. Eight are injected with streptococcus bacteria, four receive penicillin, and four are untreated. By the early hours of the next morning, the untreated mice are dead. The next day, Flory comments that the results are quite promising. Kain is less reserved and proclaims it a miracle. After further tests on a range of animals, results are published in The Lancet in August. An article in The Lancet means that the news travels the medical world, including when German authorities learn of penicillin developments through an article in The Lancet that eventually makes its way to them via neutral Sweden. But so far there is little military interest in the research. After all, these tests are limited to animal tests, and the method for extraction and purification is not yet scaled up. And as Flory says, 
Treating and curing infections in mice was one thing, but humans are roughly 3,000 times bigger and would need 3,000 times more penicillin. So they will need a bigger boat, a method that allows them to make it on an industrial scale, growing mold, extracting the drug, and purifying the drug. For that, the war now stands in their way as public and private funds for research are seen to have other priorities, especially when there are already working antibiotics. So the researchers have to resort to their creativity to soldier on. Ideally, they would move to a pharmaceutical lab and expand the research team. Instead, they recruit a team of six penicillin girls and put them to work in a university classroom. Clad head to toe in protective equipment, they are paid two pounds a week to cultivate the fungus in special containers modeled from hospital bedpans. Week by week, they laboriously extract vital milligrams of usable penicillin powder from hundreds of liters of fermenting broth, or as they call it, mold juice. By February 1941, they have a product suitable for human use that can theoretically be made at large scale. The first patient, a policeman named Albert Alexander, infected with Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, initially recovers. But despite going to great lengths, even recycling penicillin from his urine, supplies are exhausted and he dies in March after a relapse. However, for more patients with life-threatening infections are treated over the next few months, three survive with one dying of an unrelated brain hemorrhage. In the meantime, the war ranges on and on. For British troops fighting in North Africa, sulfur drugs seem to still be doing the job. Injured troops get injections in the field and intravenous drips in hospitals to stave off gangrene. Burned tissue extremely vulnerable to infection is treated with sulfur, allowing plastic surgery and skin grafts to be performed. Venereal diseases are kept in check, although antibiotic resistance is developing, and the arrival of the new American drug sulfaguanidine helps to treat dysentery. But the Oxford team are confident that penicillin will do the job even better. Their August 1941 Lancet article states that it is far more effective against the coccus bacteria, streptococci, staphylococci, etc., than the sulfas, but is also far less toxic to white blood cells. Again, copies of this article make their way to Germany. As well as the Oxford team's results, it includes details of the medium in which the mold is grown and, crucially, the new method for extraction. But none of the warring nations, including Britain, have extra resources to launch for large-scale trials or mass production of what is still seen as an experimental drug. In Germany, there is even less interest. The Nazi authorities have limited distribution of the Lancet, which they view as a Jewish publication. So most actual scientists will only hear of the new drug in about a year. In fact, right now, one of the few people who can get their hands on them is Hitler's physician Theodor Morel, somewhat of a quack who we have covered in our episode about Hitler's drug dependencies. Link at the end of the video. Moreover, German pharmaceutical conglomerate IG Farben actually received a culture from Fleming before the war. The general opinion at IG Farben is that the sulfur drugs are good enough, and that opinion seems validated. One might note, perhaps cynically, that this opinion fits very well with the massive income IG Farben and other pharmaceuticals are generating from the sale of sulfur drugs. So, the researchers look to America still at peace and with vast resources. After obtaining more Rockefeller funding, Flory and Heatley traveled to New York in early July. Worried about losing or breaking their test tubes of penicillium, they have smeared samples of the mold on the inside of the jackets for safekeeping. It is then on to Washington, D.C. for a meeting with the National Research Council, who direct them to the Department of Agriculture in Peoria, Illinois. The Department of Agriculture has lots of experience with fermentation and quickly points towards an important innovation, corn steep liquor, a syrupy waste product from local corn mills. When they start using the rich nitrogen liquor, yields increase by nearly 2,000%. While the European belligerents are hard-pressed or unable to see the potential benefits of a new, better antibiotic, the Americans are not. 
America's entry into the war now puts urgency into the research. Only 10 days after Pearl Harbor, a meeting is convened of the Committee on Medical Research CMR, a subdivision of the Office of Scientific Research and Development (OSRD). Present are the heads and research directors of the pharmaceutical companies Merck, Pfizer, and Lederlin. They, along with Eli Lilly, had been courted by Flory earlier in the year. At the time, they were concerned that the scaling up of the fermentation process was an issue, and the windfall of a new drug would be wiped out if a commercially viable synthetic form of penicillin came to market. Informed of the success of the cornstarch innovation, and with the government promising substantial support, the pharmaceutical giants agreed to lend their weight. This is the beginning of a project that will eventually see 21 companies working together to develop the antibiotic at a total cost of about $14 million, around a quarter of a billion dollars in 2021. The resources of the big corporations yield fast improvements, especially on the industrialization of the process, but still the challenges facing the coalition are huge, as John L. Smith, a chemist at Pfizer, puts it. The mold is as temperamental as an opera singer. The yields are low, the isolation is difficult, the extraction is murder, the purification invites disaster, and the assay is unsatisfactory. By June 1942, only enough penicillin has been produced under the OSRD to treat 11 patients. However, the Department of War pushes the project relentlessly, and large-scale trials are soon planned for the following year. Around the same time, seeing potential problems with sulfa after all, the Germans at IG Farben also start looking into the drug. They quickly discover that the penicillium held by IG Farben is so old that it is no longer viable, though. Searching for alternatives, they look to the occupied countries. A culture held in Holland is found to be from a poor producing strain, and the Pasteur Institute in Paris and the University of Copenhagen cleverly ensure that their culture stay out of German hands. Once the Germans do manage to find a usable strain, they are faced with the same challenges of low yields and with harvesting and purifying the mixture. Unlike the Americans, the German government do not devote significant resources of funding or manpower to the project until much later in the war. In 1942, IG Farben's facility in Frankfurt counts less than 10 employees on the job. They will not implement the industrial-scale fermentation processes until 1944, so we'll be stuck with pathetically small quantities of penicillin until then. British intelligence even continue to permit press reporting on penicillin because they are so confident that the Germans will never catch up. But maybe there's another reason they don't censor news about the drug. Everyone understands that penicillin might save more lives, but sulfa is still doing at least part of that job. Sure, you might get some wounded back in action faster, but it's not turning around some of the wounded soldiers faster that will win the war. Not a wonder drug, but logistics, military strategy, and economic might is what they believe should be the main focus. That said, we shouldn't diminish the effect that the creation of penicillin will have. In the last year of the war, the Allies will have managed to stockpile massive amounts of the drug, and it turns out that it does work much better than sulfa. So thanks to penicillin, tens of thousands of GIs and Tommies who would probably have died from infections will instead go home to their friends and families. But no, penicillin will not win the war. The impact will be too small for that and come at a time when things are decided anyway. It will, however, definitely save lives. After the war, it will change human life forever. The most common cause of death before penicillin, even with sulfa, bacterial infection, will be treatable and most often survivable. At least until bacteria also start to develop resistance to penicillin. I mentioned Hitler's drug use. We also did a special about the wonder drug the German Wehrmacht used liberally to stay alert and fighting, especially at the beginning of the war, sometimes with catastrophic effects, methamphetamine. Links to the two videos are here beside me. You'll also see Indy looking like a mad pharmaceutical researcher there. Make sure we can continue keeping that knowledge growing at an industrial scale by joining the Tangos Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Never forget.